Welcome. All right. Uh, I think we're good to go with uh, Blake, this guy this month. Hi, thanks for having me. My name is Blake Ninker. I'm your tour guide for this guy this month. Um, the the time period that we're talking about, of course, is from today, um, so November 13, through uh, the next Recreational Astronomy Night meeting, which I think is December 15. Um, so my uh, information here is talking about essentially the next four weeks, but we're obviously straddling uh, a couple of months um, here. The uh, I've prepared my usual materials um, for this presentation, that is, I've got my month at a glance uh, web uh, uh, calendar uh, that shows icons, various activities on each day. Um, the icons indicate the equipment that you might use um, to view it. I also have observing lists that I've prepared for um, popular astronomy applications, including Sky Tools and Sky Safari. Um, I've also made just a general purpose list in uh, Excel. Um, and there's lots of external links. Um, you, I have the web address for this article at the end of this presentation, but if you looked on the website now, you'd find all that information there now. Um, so there's lots of details there. Everything that I'm talking about, including all the specific dates, um, are noted in that presentation. Starting off with the sun, um, it's curious that the sun is very active right now. It's surprisingly active, even though we're in a trough. You may know that the sun goes through a cycle um, anywhere from 9 to 14 years, and we're between solar maximums right now, but still we're getting these random interesting events with the sun, um, including uh, very large prominences. Um, uh, I did look today that there hasn't been any sunspots for about two weeks, um, but uh, or we're still getting big prominences and coronal holes and occasional aurora and, and stuff like that. Um, so worth looking at. Um, in a day or two, sunset is going to be around uh, 5 o'clock. Um, sunrise will be at 7.15, and that means that when you factor in astronomical twilight, where the sun is quite far down below the horizon, about 18 degrees or lower, that that means we get 10 and a half hours of darkness. Woo-hoo! Um, and <laughs> and uh, I didn't... I didn't like winter that much until I started get really getting into astronomy. And, the, and then end of, uh, end of this time period on December 15th, we get 11 and a half hours of darkness. Yes! Um, so that means um, if you want to do lots of visual astronomy, you'll be able to do that. And if you're an imager, you'll be able, be able to get lots of data. Um, the uh, uh, sun is in Libra right now. Um, it moves into Scorpius on November 23rd very briefly, um, and the way the constellations are oriented now, it quickly exits that and moves into Ophiuchus um, for a few months. Um, so that's interesting to uh, to note. Off to the moon here. Tom pointed this out, and I've I've thought this too, looking at this image taken by Michael Watson um, with the sort of a hazy cloud in the foreground. This reminds me of Galileo's early sketches. Um, through his, uh, his uh, early magnification instrument. Um, the moon is new on November 18th, and that's good news because that's very near the Leonid meteor shower peak. Uh, first quarter is on November 26th. Now, the day before first quarter, uh, uh, there's an opportunity to see Lunar X. Anybody seen that? Have you seen Lunar X or photographed that? Um, so that's a little X-shaped pattern that's on the surface of the... Um, moon near the terminator between lightness and darkness it just happens to be the arrangement or position of some craters in relation to one another so it's a neat thing to look for it's a very small um, feature though and you have to look at it at the right sort of time um, on uh, november 26 proper uh, there's an opportunity to see the railroad or the straight wall this is a fault um, in the surface of the moon and the lighting angle creates this very stark shadow straight as an arrow straight line in the middle of mare nubium um, so that's something to try for on the on the 26th um, uh, here's our solar system um, right now um, or in a couple of days uh, if you were flying around in outer space um, 
and uh, the um, uh, the Earth is here in the foreground, um, and the Moon's just just beyond it. Um, you can just barely see the Moon peeking out on the right edge um, there. Um, the uh, uh, if we were to draw a line down through the sun and look only to the left, um, that's effectively what you're seeing at sunset. And if you look to the right of the sun, um, you'll see there's a bunch of planets there, and that's effectively what you're seeing at sunrise. Rhonda and I have been having these interesting conversations about sunset and sunrise. Those are actually technically not correct terms. It's, it's uh, the sun's not setting, the moon's not setting, the moon's not rising. Uh, we, we have been casually referring to these periods of time as the uh, period of time when the sun rotates away from the sun. <laughs> the, the period of time when the earth rotates towards the sun. That's a bit of a mouthful. I'll continue to use the short forms um, here. But you can see Mercury is to the right of the, excuse me, the left of the sun. It's obviously very close to the sun. Um, so uh, it, it's always hard to see, but there's a good opportunity, fairly good opportunity to see it this month um, as it moves quite far away from the sun. The angular separation between the sun and the planet um, is near its maximum. Um, we call that greatest elongation. That happens on November 24th. Um, who's seen Mercury with their naked eye? Lots of people, that's good. Very challenging to see. Uh, if you've never seen it before, it took me a couple of years to sort of find it. Um, go out with binoculars. Maybe if you have an app um, on your smartphone, that'll get you looking in the right direction. And it's very small. It's a pinpoint of light. It's star-like. Um, and once you find it in binoculars, you can usually put the binoculars down and you can see it with your naked eye. Um, uh, the, the moon will be near it, the planet Mercury, on the 19th and the 20th of November. So that makes it easier to look for it, and that helps with your eyes to be able to focus um, the right amount. So that might be a good time to look for it um, here. The uh, Saturn you can see is way off in the distance. Um, there, Saturn is... Uh, setting, falling into the sun. Well, it's not falling into the sun. <laughs> Again, technically, the Earth is moving counterclockwise around the sun, um, and it, it, we're moving in such a way that the sun gets in the way. The sun is occulting um, Saturn in a, in a short period of time. So this really represents your last opportunities to look at the ringed planet. Um, so, so look at it while, while you can. Again, for the early birds, if you look to the right, you can see Mars. Um, is here. That's Ceres. We'll ignore that. Um, but Mars is there. The red planet just to the left of it is Jupiter. They're rising about three or two hours before sunrise. Um, uh, Venus, which is very bright, um, is uh, uh, visible about an hour and a half um, before sunrise. And the moon will get very close to, a thin old moon will get very close to Venus in a couple of days on the 17th. So if you're an early bird, you can look for all those planets um, in the morning. I don't think anybody saw the very close conjunction or a pulse um, that happened a couple of days ago. Anybody see it here? Um, so I, I think people out in the East Coast saw it, but that was, that was very nice. It'll happen again, um, but that's a somewhat uh, rare event. So thank you, Chris Vaughn, for providing these images from Sky Safari. This is essentially what you'll see um, uh, on November 20th. Um, looking in the west after sunset or around sunset. And notice Mercury is below that yellow line. The yellow line is the path of the planets or the, represents the plane of the solar system. And Mercury is inclined. It has a high inclination um, compared to the other planets. And unfortunately, that puts it below the ecliptic. And that means you're looking through more air. It's closer to our horizon. But uh, hopefully the moon kind of over top of it will help you spot that. Um, and you can say, see Saturn's in the picture there. And if we look the other way in the morning, um, this is the image from the 13th a couple of days ago where Venus and Jupiter were practically on top of one another, Mars way up high there. But m Venus will be ro dropping in the sky as it appears to get closer um, to the sun. It's moving more rapidly than we are, um, of course. So those are your evening and morning planets. Now, if we look the other way, um, there's the Earth again, and you can see that Uranus is almost directly opposite um, from the Sun. In fact, 
Uranus went through opposition a short time ago, so it's relatively close to us. Um, the distance, if you were to measure this in Earth-Sun distances, which is the astronomical unit, um, uh, Uranus is 19 astronomical units away, um, which is quite a long distance, but, but it's, it's relatively close to us, and that means it's around magnitude 5.7. And that's kind of the magic number for some. Um, magnitude 6 is about the limit that some people can see things with their naked eye. Anybody seen Uranus? Naked eye. Um, so I saw that a couple of years ago when I was in Mew Lake in Algonquin Park. It's very challenging um, there. But that, it's an opportunity to try for that um, when you don't have any moonlight around. Um, if you're photographing it, you might be able to see details on the surface of the planet. I also like looking at planets when they're at opposition because there's a better opportunity to see some of the moons. Three of the bright moons around Uranus are Titania, um, Oberon, and Ariel. Um, Ariel is the faintest one at magnitude 14.4. So that's, that's tough. That, you know, you're going to need an 8-inch or a 10-inch telescope um, to see that. Um, very challenging. I've, I've only, I think I've seen it once. Um, over many years. December 10th is a particularly good evening um, to look at Uranus because Ariel is quite far away from the planet. Again, we're talking about elongation. The further away the moons are from the planet, there's a greater chance to see them. Ariel's quite far away, which is the innermost faint moon, um, and Oberon is visible as well. So that's a good night to try for that. Um, and I have a bunch of other dates of maximum elongations for the moons on the webpage article, so you can look those up. Notice Neptune way off to the right there. You should be looking at Neptune earlier um, in the evening as opposed to later. Both of these planets are near magnitude 4 stars, um, uh, but Neptune itself is magnitude 8. Um, so you're going to need at least binoculars to see that little pale blue dot. Um, the fascinating thing about Neptune, though, is it's much further away. It's 29 astronomical units as opposed to 19, but you can see the moon, the big moon around Neptune, easier. Um, uh, that moon is Triton, and it's magnitude 13.5. It's brighter than any of the moons of Uranus. So that's a, that's a good one to try for. Is it size? Is it because of the size or its albedo? I don't, I don't know why um, that is the case. So those are some of the objects in the solar system that I wanted to talk about. I also wanted to talk about this one. Did you hear about this? Um, the uh, fast mover um, object that came out of nowhere that initially was thought to be a comet and then it was classified as an asteroid and it was given the designation A2017U1 and I just read a day or two ago it's been reclassified as 1I. I refers to uh, interstellar. So an, the interesting thing about this object is it came from out of the solar system. Um, you, it, partly you can tell by the steep angle um, that it's coming in from the, the, uh, the solar system. Um, this was discovered by the University of Hawaii's uh, PANSTARS telescope. It was measured at 400 meters. Um, it was moving fast at 26 kilometers per second. That's about the same speed as the Earth moving um, around the solar system. Um, you can see it zipped uh, within the orbit of Mercury, did a hairpin turn, and then it got very close to the Earth, 24 million kilometers. Yeah. <laughs> oh, or 60 lunar distances, the Earth-Moon distance, 60 lunar distance. Cosmologically, that's a near miss. Okay, and we, we didn't actually see this before it reached the sun. We saw it after it had passed the sun. So, so I don't know if that makes you lose sleep at night. Um, <laughs> you know, bi big rocks. Imagine something about three or four times the size of the sky dome falling out of the sky, hitting a city. Okay, it would, it would make a dent, it would blow up that city. Um, so that, that's a little bit unnerving. I, I like to look at the table that's on the Space Weather um, website. They talk about potentially hazardous asteroids. Um, and there's another one that's coming in on the 17th, PHA, you're sitting down, PHA um, 444584 will get very near Earth within nine lunar distances. So that's much closer. And it's moving at about 15 kilometers per second. And it's over 300 meters in size. So that, that one's a big one. Um, but we have a well-known orbit for that. It's going to miss us. Nothing to worry about um, here. But um, it's not like we can do anything about it. 
You know, we could ask Bruce Willis to go on a rocket ship and <laughs> may, yeah, he's maybe busy. We, we actually don't have a very good planetary defense system in place yet. There's lots of talk. The space agencies around the world um, are, are discussing this. There are conferences about this, but I don't know if we see one coming in big, we're, n we're not going to be able to do a lot about it. That, that said, you know, the, the one that you may know of, <laughs> the, the Chicxulub crater, the Chicxulub crater that's in the Yucatan Peninsula was made by a comet or asteroid that was 10 to 15 kilometers in size. Okay, so something that big coming towards us, we'll be able to see it. And that'll give you time to pack your bags. Asteroids that you can look at, that you can measure, that you can help refine the orbits on, are ones that block stars. Uh, asteroid occultations are pretty common. I've noted three on our website that have ranks over 90% that block stars that are magnitudes 11 to 12 um, and are um, going to block the starlight for three seconds or longer. So I've noted three of those. This is one of them that you can see you can do from your backyard if you live in Toronto. Um, that's flying right over Toronto. And that's at a decent time. It's around midnight between December 5 and December 6. So that's a good one to check out. See the webpage article for more. Um, of course, meteors um, are hitting the Earth all the time. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but the, the average value for the amount of material that hits the Earth every day is 100 to 200 tons. But most of these are small, they're the size of dust particles, and we see them as streaks. Um, across the sky. Um, uh, the Orionid meteors happened a short time ago. Anybody see the, any of the Orionids? R Rhonda and I were in a dark sky location and we together we counted around 20, which is on par. That's the blue hump um, here um, in this graph. Um, so the one between October and November, that's, that's the uh, Orionids. The Leonids are coming up soon. Again, there's not going to be a moon around to see those. The Leonids are the little gray taupe hump um, here, this little short one between November and December. Um, but that's about 15 per hour. The interesting thing about the Leonids, though, is they are the fastest moving meteors at 71 kilometers per second, and they often produce fireballs. And I don't know what it is, but this is one of these things that the media gets on every year. Oh, the Leonids are going to be the best meteor shower ever. Um, they say that every year, and it's usually bleh. Um, so, but, but you can see that when you look at this chart that we are in winter meteor season. Um, but a lot of people don't consider that, or they know about the Perseids, of course, in August. But there's lots of meteor showers going on in this time of year through to... January and February. And notice the red line there, that's the Geminids. Um, and they produce 120 per hour. That's two a minute. Um, so strap on your woolies and go outside on December 13th. Oh, that's a meeting night. Um, but <laughs> maybe around that, um, take a look at the uh, Geminid meteors. Oh, is it that day before? Okay, good. Um, uh, fun fact, the uh, first um, photograph of a meteor was taken on November 26, 1885. Some constellations for your consideration. I've noted some constellations that are up high um, in the sky um, that hopefully um, uh, we'll be able to see through cloud and, and so on. Um, uh, the, uh, I have one constellation that's quite low in this presentation, so it's a challenge uh, target for you. And then on the website article, I have one that's even lower. Um, in the sky, but we'll start with uh, Camelopardalis that's very high in the sky, which is mostly made up of faint dim stars, hard to make out the stick figure of the giraffe in there, but it's very close, you can see to Ursa Minor um, and um, uh, the uh, Polaris star. Um, so here's some of the objects that you might consider in this area. There's a tight double star, uh, Struve 389, there's a big open cluster, uh, Colander 464. I've noted in the the many of these uh, constellations uh, ARP objects. This is a catalog by Halton ARP that are very faint dim galaxies and usually it's a galaxy 
uh, or features a couple of galaxies that have been distorted or morphed in some way because there's usually a bunch in the area and they're interacting gravitationally with one another. So if you see them, they're usually very interesting to look at. You will also notice that there's a comet in the area. C 2017-01 is exiting um, this constellation, moving towards Polaris. Um, so that's, the, that's a bunch of objects to try for. I forgot to mention at the beginning of all this that all, many of the objects that I'm talking about here, the planets and these um, deep sky objects are targets on some of our certificate programs. So if you're going for your finest NGCs, uh, the RASC finest NGCs, there's a few targets here. Uh, if you're going for your Herschel 400s, there's a few here. If you're just starting out with the Explore the Universe certificate, a bunch of easy targets to uh, get to. Here's Perseus. Um, lots of nice objects in this area. It's up high in the sky. Um, again, I've noted a number of objects here, including a Messier um, target, uh, the variable star Algol. Up at the top of the um, Eiffel Tower um, is a nice double star, colorful double star there. There's another one of those ARPS. And then the finest NGC 1491, which you might get out the hydrogen filter for. If you have a hydrogen filter for your eyepiece or for your imaging rig, you might use that. And uh, it's a very nice uh, colorful object there. If you're looking at with just your eye, you'll see this faint dim fan shaped um, object. There's Taurus. Um, you can see the yellow line going through Taurus. Once again, that's the path of the planets or the ecliptic. So that means the moon's going to wander through this scene at various times. Uh, over the course of months or, or the year, you'll see planets travel through here. It's neat when the moon goes through here because there's a good chance that it's going to block a number of bright stars. So you'll get occultations or grazes um, of stars that are in this area. Um, and of course, it has the two really bright um, clusters in here, perhaps the most famous of which is the Subaru or the Pleiades. Lots of interesting objects in here. And again, these are all documented on the webpage article. Um, I've noted something uh, here. You'll see the description micro lens. So this is referring to um, a notification that was sent out by the American Association of Variable Star Observers um, a short time ago about a star that went from magnitude 14 up to magnitude 10. Um, so it became much, much brighter, but it was determined that this is due to micro lensing. And this was something that was predicted by Einstein like 100 years ago, where he talked about how light would be bent by extreme gravity. So the light pattern around um, some objects that are in this area are causing the star to appear to brighten. So it's an unusual event. I photographed it recently and it looks like it's dimming, but there, the AV, AAVSO is asking that people continue to observe this um, and collect more data and do, do some reporting um, on that. There's the finest NGC 1514 that's in the area. This is my black and white image of it, but I'm looking forward to processing this in color because you can see that nebula around the star is a really deep blue color. Um, so that, that'll be neat. Um, Malcolm Park recently took a photograph of that and you can see it in color. Here's Auriga. This is a fantastic constellation to look at with just binoculars. You see the Milky Ways in the background. There's all kinds of open clusters and groupings of stars. You'll be able to see nebula with your binoculars if you're in a dark sky location. And of course, it's filled with a bunch of Messiers um, to look at as well, and another finest um, NGC in that area. Note the yellow line again. The planets are going to go close um, to that, so that might make so for some interesting scenes. Here's Aries, um, kind of a w bit of a weird constellation, that bent line stick figure. I don't know how you get a sheep or... <laughs> or a ram uh, out of that. I don't, I don't know, but well, it, it is what it is. Um, so a bunch of interesting objects in here. Note that the uh, asteroid uh, Iris, number seven, is in the area moving to the southwest. The star that you can see, I've noted up near the top left here, HD 20367, is interesting. This is an exosolar system. Um, so it has a, a exoplanet. Um, around it. The star is a G0 spectral class star, similar to ours. And the one known exoplanet is about the size of Jupiter. Now it's, it's magnitude six or seven, that star. You'll need binoculars to pick it up. Um, but it'll be interesting if you can see that star and you think about it, you'll go, there's a solar system there and it's maybe like ours. So that, that's kind of cool. Um, here's your challenge object here for Nax. Um, constellation, another silly stick figure constellation, <laughs> two stars and a stick. 
there, the furnace, I don't know how you get a furnace out of that, but uh, um, so <laughs> a bunch of interesting objects here. If you're looking for it, this is very low. The green line this time is the horizon. Um, so it's just above the horizon, but you can see it fully clears um, the horizon. The other constellation I've noted on the webpage article is Columba. Did you know you can see Columba? All of Columba um, in southern Ontario. So some challenged low objects here, assuming you got perfectly clear sight lines to the south and clear skies, transparent skies. Um, hopefully you can spot these objects. Look for Orion. It's down and right of Orion. Um, and you can see Eridanus weaving all around it to the left and the bright star Akamar, um, uh, the brightest star in, in Eridanus may help get you in the right area. Um, so that there's some challenge ob objects in there for uh, sure. There's a bright uh, planetary nebula, NGC 1360, uh, in that location. So a bunch of deep sky objects for your consideration. Um, bit of an uh, update on um, spaceflight, human spaceflight. Here there's lots going on in Ottawa. If you're heading towards the nation's capital, um, there's the Canadian Space Summit. That's next week. And then in early December, there's the Dream Chaser event. Um, the Boeing Dream Chaser craft uh, successfully landed and didn't break its landing gear um, this time. Uh, the International Space Station, if you're looking for that, it will resume evening flyovers starting November 26. So you'll be able to see that bright point of light silently moving across the sky knowing there's some uh, humans up there. Um, the Orbital ATK company recently launched a resupply uh, craft um, to space station. It's probably docking or has docked there um, now. And uh, they named that um, space truck um, uh, Gene Cernan, which I thought was apropos. Um, that's the last astronaut that visited the moon. Um, so Apollo 17, I don't know if you know this or not, but we haven't been there for 45 years. Humans haven't been in another world um, since October 13th, 1972. Um, uh, that was the space race, right? Um, uh, I read an interesting article on the BBC uh, website a, a couple of weeks ago that was talking about the new space race. And it's between companies now. So it's kind of exciting what's going on. SpaceX and Orbital ATK and other companies, um, very, very active. SpaceX is tentatively launching on November 27th um, a resupply mission to the International Space Station. Um, they've been really busy this year with almost a rocket launch every month, and they've been successfully recovering their Stage 1 rockets. Um, so they're driving down the, uh, the costs um, of space flight. That's pretty interesting. Um, uh, the Australia um, uh, uh, country uh, has, is celebrating their 50th anniversary um, this month. Uh, they were the seventh country to have a satellite in space. Um, and they're launching a space agency. Um, that was in the news a little while ago. So they're jumping on this new space race bandwagon as well. So lots going on um, there. Uh, I understand there's a secret mission by SpaceX uh, launching tomorrow. Um, as well, I just, <laughs> I just saw that. Can't tell you about that though. Um, <laughs> um, this shot by Malcolm Park, I quite like. This is what you may see in a couple of days, assuming there are clear skies in the morning um, where the moon and Venus and there's some other bright stars or planets up high um, there. Just to recap briefly, um, over the next couple of mornings, you have Venus and Jupiter in the morning sky and the moon will be nearby. We have the Leonid meteor shower that might produce some fast fireballs and maybe will outburst. Um, uh, November 21st in the evening, the moon and Mercury and um, Saturn will be nearly in a straight line. Um, I talked about those dates around the first quarter for Lunar X and the straight wall. And in December, starting on the 4th, we have the Geminid meteor shower, which peaks on the 13th. So try to see those. That's the best meteor shower of the year, um, in theory. And December 10, again, is a good time, a good evening to look at um, Uranus. So a lot's going on um, over the next few uh, days. I just wanted to shout out um, to all the people that helped me build this presentation. I draw data from lots of different sources. I use lots of different software tools, so I just want to recognize all of them. Um, thank you. And uh, uh, the, again, everything that I've talked about is on the website. You can go to rasto.ca. You'll find all the information there with all those other materials that I talked about. Uh, with your smartphone, you can scan that QR code if you want, and that'll take you straight um, to that article. I, there's probably no time for questions.